John Piper has decided to weigh in on the Can Women Be Pastors debacle and has again put his foot in his mouth, at least from my perspective, not from the perspective of most of his followers. What is Piper's position? Not only should women not lead churches, they shouldn't even lead parachurch ministries. Evidently, Piper's position is the SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention, didn't go far enough. I must wonder if this is just attention-seeking from a pastor whose ministry is falling by the wayside. If so, it didn't work. But the root of John Piper's problem, as we shall see, is transphobia. Let's have a chat. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me and especially to my patrons and channel members. I have new channel members to announce. Pinworm, Phil Thompson, and Marcelo Suplicy, I hope I pronounced that right, I apologize if I did not, have all joined the family. Thank you all. I hemmed and hawed a bit about covering this as Piper's popularity is waning and his ministry is on the decline. The scandal over allegations of spiritual and abuse of power in the church that he led for over 30 years, Bethlehem Baptist, was a big part of it. Hundreds left the church and many in leadership resigned. Piper's recent statement on the role of women in the church has garnered some attention. Try googling women leading parachurch organizations, and instead of stories about women leaders in such organizations, five of the six first things to appear are all about John Piper. What surprised me about all of them wasn't what John Piper's position was. That is completely consistent with what Piper's been saying for the last 50 years. After all, a man that thinks that women should submit to physical abuse from her husband to support her husband, I would expect to say can't lead a parachurch organization. If it's not requiring her to sin, but simply hurting her, then I think she endures verbal abuse for a season and she endures perhaps being smacked one night. But Piper's position is the Southern Baptist in kicking out any church that allows female pastors didn't go far enough. Any parachurch organization needs to keep women out of leadership roles as well. Will he stop there? Well, male and female roles in the local church are clearly defined in the Bible. We believe those roles are clearly defined in the Bible. Interesting that the narrator had to clarify the question from male and female roles are clearly defined in the Bible to we believe those roles are clearly defined in the Bible, as their position is a minority position, though it would not have been 50 years ago. The fact that this is a minority position shows that the Bible is not clear on this, as there is disunity on the issue among the devout. Either that, or even the devout don't know how to correctly interpret the Bible, which again would point to the Bible not being clear on this issue. Uh, Pastor John, hello. I work for a global parachurch organization, which is well known. Recently, our leadership decided that all positions of leadership within the organization will be open to women. This includes campus leadership, regional leadership, and national leadership. Women will be permitted to teach men from the scripture, to be in positions of spiritual authority over men, to shape and correct doctrine within the organization, to mentor men in their ministry roles. Oh no, how horrifying. They are letting women read all by themselves. When I heard the reference to campus leadership, I wondered if Crew was the organization that the writer was referring to, but not likely. They've allowed women in leadership positions for a long time, possibly since their inception. Look at that. I'm using their language. They allow women in leadership. Correcting myself here. They recognize that women are leaders too and acknowledge that hiring the best and most qualified person for the job is best for the organization. If your God can't seem to understand that, the problem is with your God. Previously, these positions of spiritual authority over men were reserved for men alone. 
The reason given for this change is that a parachurch organization is not the church. Therefore, the commands addressed to churches about the role of men and women in relationship to one another do not apply in this case. That certainly seems reasonable. I mean, the rules about tithing don't mean that believers need to tithe to every parachurch organization that they join. The rules about head coverings for the churches that even follow this one only apply inside the church, except for the Mennonites and the Amish. Even the Dale Partridges would say it only applies inside the church. If the rules about church leadership apply outside the church, why limit that to parachurch organizations? Why not secular organizations? Hell, why not families? If a man has an unbelieving child, he shouldn't be allowed to lead the family. Oh, wait. I just fired Pastor John from his high horse. I, I, I mean, from his position as head of his family. Oh, well. Better luck next time, John. How do you see it? Well, that's sad to hear to me, uh, but it's not surprising yeah. and it's not new. Mm-hmm. How many of you empathized with John for being sad that organizations that are not churches do not choose their leaders by following the rules for who can be a pastor or elder in a church? I thought so. Piper would likely argue that 1 Timothy 2.12 says a woman is not to teach or have authority over a man. This one is not in the section about church leaders, thus the argument could be made that it applies outside the church. But here's the kicker. Read the rest of that verse. It also says that women are to remain silent. I know of no church that claims that this applies outside of the church. It's in the same goddamned verse. If the verse holds that women are not to teach or have authority over men outside of the church, then the rest of the verse should also hold outside of the church. Women should not be able to teach or have authority in parachurch organizations and also should remain silent in these organizations. I'd like to see that. A silence strike by all the women in parachurch organizations. See how well they function if all the women are silent. Pastor John has never urged men to refrain from buying books by women authors. That is not only a form of speaking, but women teach men in these books. Even if the books are aimed at women, if Piper really thinks it's wrong for women to teach men, then not only should he shun all books by women authors, he should also be urging other men to do the same. Hypocrisy runs deep with this one. The position that the teachings of the Bible concerning sexuality have no bearing on human relationships outside the church or the home is naive. And there you go. Thinking that women should be allowed to speak outside of church or the home is naive. Actually, to call it naive is perhaps too gentle. Whoa, I was not expecting this. Seriously. Someone needs to remind Piper that the verse that says that women are not to have authority over men also says that women are to remain quiet in the ESV, the version that John Piper prefers. Many translations say silent. Here is the word in the Greek. I don't know how to pronounce it. It occurs only four times in the Bible, two of them in this chapter, and three of them apply to women. The fourth is in Acts, where the crowd becomes quiet or silent when Paul speaks. So whether this intends for women to be completely silent or to speak in low tones is unclear, at least from the English translations. Either way, Piper cannot make the case that women should have no authority over men outside the church and not also make the claim that women need to be quiet outside the church. You see what I mean about him remaining politically neutral? yet at the same time heavily implying his position. Can women run for Congress? You will never hear Piper answer that question directly. But he had made it clear that he thinks women should not have authority over men. Period. Anywhere. Which would, by necessity, mean that women should never run for office or be CEO of any company unless all the employees are female. And limiting employment to female employees would be a violation of equal opportunity laws. Because 
it could also be called culturally compromised. In other words, the pressures of our culture to view maleness and femaleness as having no built-in natural God-ordained differences that would shape our different relationships and responsibilities, those pressures are so great that many Christians today surrender to them. They have no choice. It's that or die as an organization. The young are leaving the church in droves, primarily because of how the church condemns them and their friends for being who they are, who God made them to be, if that really is God's doing, as Piper would claim. The church has no other options than to embrace reality, the reality that some people are gay and that it isn't a lifestyle choice, or to try to deny that reality and die. The role of women in the church is up there as a divisive issue, as we just saw the SBC expel its largest supporting church and three others over this issue in the video I made two weeks ago. It comes down to this. The church can admit that they made a mistake in interpreting this first in the past and embrace women in leadership positions. Or they can continue to exclude women, holding to the hypocrisy that women can speak but not lead, despite the prohibition of those two things being in the same verse. And regardless of which way a church goes, one person will continue to fail to weigh in on issue and express an opinion as to which one he wants. God. God, again, just like in any other crisis and issue that the church faces, remains conspicuously silent in the matter. You would think that at some point these pastors and apologists would notice that they continue to defend a God that they claim cares more about this than they do, yet theirs are the only voices we ever hear on the subject. The world today is in a freefall of denial. Project much? And that denial used to be that male and female personhood teaches us nothing about what God intended our roles to be. But now the denial is that our bodies teach us nothing about what life should be as male or female. You can cut off breasts. You can cut off the penis. You can cut out the uterus. You can replace estrogen with testosterone. You can grow facial hair on a female cheek. At the root of the rejection that nature teaches us that men and women should relate in certain ways is the absolute refusal in our culture to allow our individual freedom to be limited in any way by an authority outside our desires. And there you have it. The root of Piper's problem is part transphobia. He fears the world is in freefall because men and women are able to express themselves in the gender of their choice. I would ask Piper, why should I limit my autonomy? What possible reason is there to put limits on who I am and what I can be? Piper would say to please God, but why? Piper would also say that God offers them no love or salvation. God not only offers them no love, but even says flat out that he hates most people that he makes, even before he makes them. So what possible reason is there for me to limit my own autonomy in favor of an alleged authority that not only has admitted to not having my best interests in mind, but has said that he hates me? Please, John, why would anyone do that? And again, the bigger problem is that you claim this is what your God wants, that God is so deeply offended by any denial of his authority that he would torture a person for eternity, not for this act, as he intended to torture the person for eternity even before he made them, and yet God remains silent, doing nothing as the world is in freefall, as you claim. What's more, Piper, you claim that nothing happens outside of God's control. You have God's plan and hand predestining the most horrible sins ever committed. Every act that every person does is the will of God. A child is abused by the clergy. That was the will of God, both for the perpetrator and for the victim. So if everything is in God's control and that is what is happening, who are you to question God's will? This is God's will. Live with it. Why, John, are you fighting God's will? 
Could it be that you don't let anything infringe upon the sovereignty of your desires? Whether tradition or God or Bible or nature or instinct or society, we will not let anything infringe upon our autonomy and the sovereignty of our desires. Are all people born the way God designed them? Does God design genetic disorders, for example? If you are able to accept that a person can be born into a defective body, and I don't see how anyone could possibly deny that as it happens daily, how can you not accept that one of the possible defects that a person can be born with is being born a female in a male body, or vice versa, a male in a female body? It's not only conceivable, but even likely given all the abnormalities that a person can be born with. In the 1920s, do you know what nurses did with babies born with spina bifida? They made them as comfortable as possible until they died, because there was nothing else they could do. But with the advancement of modern medicine, we have learned surgical techniques to correct this condition, not completely, but to the point that a person with spina bifida can lead an independent, fulfilling life. Gender dysphoria is not so different. A person with gender dysphoria had no hope of a normal life until the 1920s. In the last decade, treatment of this condition has reached the point where transgender people can live full, independent lives, free of the psychological harm that comes from being told that you can't or you shouldn't. Denying medical care to transgender people because God made them the way they are makes as much sense as denying life-saving surgery to a baby with spina bifida because the parents simply need to accept that that's the way God made their baby. What's more, if Piper is right that everything that happens is God's will, then changing one's gender if their gender doesn't match their sex is also God's will. So if God designs women to be women and men to be men, both in their bodies and in every cell of their body. And if his designs are written on their hearts, these God-given designs must be absolutely rejected because they infringe so obviously upon the autonomy of my sovereign self. So at the root of the rejection that nature teaches us that men and women should relate in certain ways and not other ways is the old reality of Romans 8, 7, the mind of the flesh, that is the natural fallen human mind is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, whether that law is in the Bible or written on the heart. Indeed, it cannot submit. Okay, so the problem is God. If a person cannot submit unless God draws them, unless God allows it, then your problem isn't with people. It's with God. Tell God he's doing it wrong. He needs to draw more people to himself so they can submit to him and please him. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. Make my day. I dare you. Tell God he's not running the world right and allowing it to be in freefall. He needs to fix it to match your desires. Those who are in the flesh, that is, who are merely human, apart from regeneration and the work of the Holy Spirit, cannot please God. Or 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly. They are foolishness to him, which is why a person who holds my understanding today would be regarded as foolish. So the culture as a whole is in a free fall of denial. And they are so at God's will and by God's direction, by your own admission. And if God wanted it to be any different, he need only make it so. Make it so, number one. Nobody in this free fall has on a parachute. It's all going to end tragically. The evidences of which are all around us, they make you want to weep. When you see what's happening to young people, what's happening to relationships, the kind of remorse and regret and carnage that is being unleashed on our culture. Then please, John, if that's the way you see it, by all means, tell your God he's not doing his job. Tell God to get with it. As a penalty for the free fall denial of God and his ways. Wait a minute. A minute ago, you said that they cannot do otherwise. Why is there a penalty for doing what God made you to do? Why is there a penalty for doing what one cannot choose not to do? That's like having a penalty for breathing. 
If you're right, John, and people cannot choose otherwise, and the result of this path is destruction, it is destruction that your God designed, orchestrated, and executed all on his own. If there is any weeping to be done, it should be weeping that anyone would choose to serve this horrid God. Weep that you find your desire for this monster. Weep that this evil being has forced you to submit to his will. Herein lies the evil. Weep for yourself that you are so deluded as to call this God good. And the gravitational pull of this free fall is in almost every movie, every online drama, every advertisement, every newscast, so that a person who stands up and draws attention to God's word or the teaching of nature and questions the wisdom of undifferentiated sex roles will not only be thought a fool, but also unjust and very likely soft on abuse. Says the man that claims that women need to submit to physical abuse from their husbands. Is it even possible to get any softer on abuse than that? Even though all the while the sex-leveling egalitarian impulses wreak havoc at every level of our culture, mocking and distorting the very kind of strength and responsibility and leadership that we so need from men. Transphobia wasn't enough? Since Piper has already said that this is God's doing, why does he think men can fix it through leadership? Newsflash, John. Men have been the predominant leaders throughout history. They are the ones who got us here. If the world really is going to hell in a handbasket, maybe it's time for men to step aside. Get out the way! Get out the way! And let the women take control. All of that to say, the argument that the biblical teachings on manhood and womanhood don't have any bearing on roles outside the home and church is both naive and culturally compromised. Two reasons for thinking this way. One is that when the Apostle Paul gave his instruction that only spiritually qualified men should teach and exercise authority in the church, his argument was not based on culture nor on family or church or structures, ecclesiastical structures or any others. It was based on two things, the order of man and woman in creation and the dynamics between man and woman in the fall. Yep, it's so simple. God just likes men better. After all, he made them first and told them to be the rulers. Or did he? This is, by scholarly consensus, a forgery. It claims to be written by Paul, but the consensus of biblical textual critics is that it is a forgery. It is exactly the word of a man, and who knows what man, that men should be in charge. Piper wants all to abide by it because it puts him in charge. Piper, like all men, desires power. Nine rings were gifted to the race of men who, above all else, desire power. What's more, the claim that the woman was deceived and therefore men need to be in charge is naive and short-sighted. When the woman was deceived, Adam was with her. If he was not deceived also, he need only have said so. So either Adam was also deceived at the same time, or he was a coward that sat back and let Eve eat the fruit to see what would happen, and when she didn't die, then he ate it too. If this story were true, it's a case for women needing to be in charge, as the man was too cowardly to act, and it was up to the woman to find the truth, and she did, that God was a liar, as she didn't die. Honestly, why are men so threatened by women with knowledge? Why must they hoard power for themselves? So Paul saw in the Genesis account of God's word that built into creation from the beginning before the fall was a peculiar responsibility of men to bear the burden of leadership and care. Where do you see this in the text? Adam is sitting there watching what Eve is going to do, not exercising any leadership or care. Or is your point that men are such utter failures as leaders that they can only succeed by not allowing the role to women who might naturally take up that position? And he saw in the way Adam was present and silent as Satan drew Eve into deceit, that the abandonment of this leadership, in that case, in Adam's passivity and silence, the abandonment of his leadership bears very bad fruit. 
so you agree with me. Adam was such a dismal failure as a leader that God promoted him and all men to perpetual leadership. How is that a good thing? I know you claim that the problem is his abandonment led to the fall, but you really need to go back further than that point. Eve eating the fruit was not the cause of the fall. It was the last thing in the chain of events. But all of the events were orchestrated by God and predestined by God. Since Eve had no choice in eating the fruit, then any bad result is the bad result that God planned and orchestrated. And by it, God gives himself the excuse to inflict all sorts of evil on the world. And you love this God. Why? So, the fact that Paul gave instruction for how this original design relates to the church in no way implies that it is limited to the church or the home. That was one application of many. Right. So, women are to be silent not only in the church, but in the home and outside the church as well. Since the first part of the verse isn't limited, then the end portion of that verse should also not be limited. Try to sell that one to your church, that all the women should not speak. At all. Anywhere. How about girls? Should girls be permitted to talk? At what age should girls be told that they are no longer permitted to speak? I doubt even your wife would go along with this one. And you can see this again in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul is helping the church preserve the dynamics of manhood and womanhood. He says at one point, this is verse 14, does not nature teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? No, it really isn't. Now, what I take that to mean is this. Has not God put in man by nature the impulse that to take on culturally feminine symbols is disgraceful. No, I don't take that from that verse at all. What's more, I find it disgraceful that you think a man with feminine characteristics is disgraceful. You degrade women by claiming this, as if to be female is a lesser thing. Paul also says that in Christ there is no male or female. Women are not inferior beings. A man being mistaken for a woman is not being mistaken for a second-class citizen. Mistaking a man for a woman is just an error, not a disgrace. And we should agree with him. Why? Because you like being superior? Nature teaches it is disgraceful. No, it doesn't. Apart from the Bible, I see nowhere that being male is superior to being female. Nowhere in nature is there the claim that for a male to be seen as female is a disgrace. Nature has no disgrace. This is a human concept, not a natural one. The Bible teaches and nature teaches. We might say today, does not nature teach you that for a man to wear a dress and stockings and high heels and lipstick is a disgrace? No, it really doesn't. You feel that way because you aren't used to seeing that. But if all men dress that way, you would find this to be completely natural. In some cultures, it is. Clothing for men and women is the same in some cultures. It is not a natural disgrace. It's only counter to your personal sensibilities. And nature teaches that. It is written on the heart. No, it really isn't. Again, I point you to numerous cultures where such Heart messages are not written. But it is there. It is inescapable. And with regard to men and women in parachurch organizations, I think Paul would say, I have taught, Moses has taught, nature teaches that it goes against man's and woman's truest God-given nature to place a woman in a role of regular, direct, personal leadership over men. Now, if you wonder, well, what do you mean, Piper, by regular, direct, personal, then since this is a a short podcast, I have to refer you to my little booklet, What's the Difference? You don't have to buy it. Just go to Desiring God, type in What's the Difference book, and download it for free. And on page 58 and following, I define regular, direct, personal. Let's look at it. Once again, Piper tries to remain neutral on saying exactly what women may and may not do, but he slips a bit in the coming pages. He clearly thinks that some jobs should ban women. 
For Piper, it's okay for a woman to lead men in a secular job, provided she signal the men under her that she respects their responsibility to protect and lead. Not sure how that works in reality when she's the one in the leadership position. Piper says a woman's leadership should be non-personal and non-directive as much as possible because to the degree that a woman's influence over man is personal and directive, it will generally offend a man's good God-given sense of responsibility and leadership and thus controvert God's created order. This is how Piper gets around it being okay to read a book by a woman author. Her leadership is non-personal and non-directive. It would be hard to see how a woman could be a drill sergeant over men without violating their sense of masculinity and her sense of femininity. And finally, the God-given sense of responsibility for leadership in a mature man will not generally allow him to flourish long under a personal directive leadership of a female superior. J.I. Packer suggested that a situation in which a female boss has a male secretary puts a strain on the humanity of both. I think this would be true in other situations as well. Some of the more obvious ones would be in military combat settings, if women were positioned so as to deploy and command men, or in professional baseball, if a woman is made the umpire to call balls and strikes and frequently to settle heated disputes among men. And I would stress that this is not necessarily owing to male egotism, but to a natural and good penchant given by God. According to Piper, men cannot flourish under the leadership of women. Somehow, they will all just shrivel up and become a shell of their former selves because of their inability to cope with female leadership. Yet boys are most often raised under the female leadership of their mothers. Does something happen in male puberty that I'm unaware of that makes men cringe at taking direction from a woman when they've already been doing that for almost all of their lives? If so, pray tell, what is this? Human flourishing is important. If female leadership were in fact a detriment of male flourishing, this would be something we would need to consider. But is this claim true? No, it isn't. Countries that are led by women do not see men shriveling up under the female leadership. Companies led by female CEOs do not end up losing their male employees as they can no longer function under women leaders. Women are umpires in professional baseball. Women are refs in professional football. And no, John, they don't need to project a signal of femininity to do their jobs. Women are leaders in the military. Our military has not suffered from this fact. Further, women military leaders are common in other countries as well, and the men are not suffering as a result. To the contrary, not allowing women to be in leadership positions does demonstrably detract from female flourishing. Limiting opportunities to women leaves them unable to use and develop themselves as persons. It limits their growth. The difference is the women are discriminated against and are told that they are only allowed the inferior roles in the world that Piper wants, whereas the world that allows women to be all they can be, to borrow from the army slogan, in no way is a limitation on men. Men can still reach for the stars and work to achieve their potential. That they are asked to share that opportunity to women should cause them to work all the harder as the field of competition is now bigger. If the only way for men to flourish is to not allow women into the game, who is the weaker sex? If a woman needs to stroke a man's ego by signaling to him that although she's the boss, she recognizes his responsibility to protect and lead her, who is really protecting whom here? If the men are this fragile that they can't do their jobs unless all the women signal their submission to their responsibility to protect and lead them, then maybe it's the men that don't belong here. When women are banned from positions of leadership, it's not just the women who suffer. It's the men, too. The men are also deprived of the contributions that the women would make if they were given the opportunity to use their skills. As to your claim that men cannot flourish under female leadership, I need to borrow a bit from Godless Engineer here. Citation needed, sir. 
Your bare-ass claim doesn't make it true. These are days of great shifting in people's convictions and alignments on this issue of how men and women should relate to each other. Should that alone not tell you that this is not a natural God-given order of things? If it were, then cultural influences should not change it. It should seem unnatural to all, not just the old fuddy-duddies like Piper. It comes down to the culture is changing and Piper doesn't like it. So he's going to claim that God doesn't like it either, even though according to his theology, it's all God's doing and God's will. What do you know? Piper managed to hit all of my buttons. In one 12-minute podcast, he managed to spout nonsense about Christian theology, disparage the transgender community, and try to infantilize women. I really would like to see him address the question, if God is really in control of everything, and everything that happens is God's will, then why bemoan anything to anyone but God? And also, if the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and this is God's will, why is John Piper standing in his way? Live your life. But you made it. Have a cookie.